The first Portuguese navigators who explored around here spoke of the Imragen. Until very recently, the Imragen were slaves of the Gulatsbach, nomads dedicated to shepherding camels. The nomads weren't especially fond of fish, but they traded in it, dried and salted, and they transported it down to the south, where it was in greater demand. They were the first to trade with the Christians, also offering them ostrich feathers or gold in exchange for gunpowder. Times have changed, but the relationships are still similar. Most of the Gulatsbach have abandoned the nomadic life and now occupy privileged positions in the government or in the modern economy, while the Imragen continue in a subtle relationship of servitude towards their former masters. The fishing method used by the Imragen is very traditional. On the beach, the men look for a school of fish. They proceed with discretion, in silence, stalking their prey like true cats of the sea. The teams tend to be made up of six men. Three of them work in the water dragging the nets. The other three stay on shore. While some surround the fish, others beat the water, driving them into the net. It must be a quick and coordinated action, perfectly timed, so that the fish cannot escape, except into the nylon net. The Imragen have always fished this way from the shore. The use of boats with lateen sails is recent and was introduced by sailors from the Canary Islands at the end of the 19th century. There is an ancient legend spread by the naturalist Jacques Cousteau, according to which dolphins help the Imragen make their catches. It's said that the men communicate with them in a secret language and that the dolphins follow their instructions and lead the fish into the nets. Unfortunately, it's only a legend. It's true that the fishermen often observe the dolphins to locate the large schools of fish, but that's all. species most often caught by the Imragen. Since they move in large groups and very close to the shore, they are easier to catch, although the fishermen don't get much in return. Mullet is not valued on international markets and can only be used for home consumption on the national market. seem to live in a time bubble, in an idyllic and romantic universe. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Behind the appearances, there is conflict. The Imragen suffer from the same problems as other peoples who live within protected spaces. How does one respect their right to progress and still protect the environment? These people live on a daily basis the intense dilemma of a traditional culture as it faces the challenges of modern life. Can progress be balanced with a respect for identity, with the right of all peoples to preserve their culture, and with mankind's need for its diversity to be preserved? Yo, 
We live under many restrictions. We can only use certain kinds of nets. We are not allowed to use motors or to fish for more profitable catch, such as shark or manta ray. We know that it is for the good of the park, but we don't receive any compensation in exchange for this. And can you earn a good living under these circumstances? They prohibit us from using motors and then no one controls the coast. So boats from outside enter the park and do everything that we are not allowed to. Our hands and feet are tied. It is impossible for us to get ahead. And the fish continue to disappear because no one is controlling the people who are really depleting the stock. Ah! During the weeks of filming, Bamba Fal kept talking to us about a place that both disturbed and fascinated him. It was the island of Arguin, a modern reincarnation of the Republic of Women, the governesses and midwives who use men as breeders and laborers. I always like to come to this place. Not because it's especially attractive, because it's not, but because of the strength of the women who live here. The island of Arguin is located on the northern end of the nature reserve, close to the Cape Blanc Peninsula and the city of Nuaribu. It's an inhospitable, out of the way place where nature shows no mercy for the weak. Until well into the 20th century, only a few Portuguese sailors and small colonies of fishermen ever dared to live here, although they all soon emigrated to less cruel lands. In the 15th century, the Portuguese built a fort here, and Mrs. Embarca and her daughters built the town of Agadir on the ruins of that fort. Nowadays, about 100 people live here, all the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of this great matriarch. She belongs to the Barakala tribe, considered a warlike people who possess magical powers. When she settled on the island, she did so with a handful of men who served as lovers and laborers. Her energy and strong personality helped her to win everyone's respect and to build a village where once there had been only a few rocks. When I arrived, the lady, now in her 80s, was very ill, and it was impossible to see her. But her daughters, nieces, and granddaughters received me with warmth. I would like to know when you arrived here and how you first organized yourselves. My mother and my aunts arrived here the same year that they put the rails down in the mines. I suppose that the white man who did it know the exact year. I think it was in 1962. They moved in with tents, and the first thing my mother did was to put the old water deposits built by the Portuguese back into working order. Then, between us all, everything got done, bit by bit, with a lot of hard work. What is your relationship with the men who live with you? We are all equal here. We set the rules and decide when something should be done. But when it comes to doing the work, we all pitch in the same, regardless of sex. Some of us have husbands, others are single, divorced, or have been married several times. The most important thing in Agadir is to have a lot of children so that the village grows. That is the most important thing, to have many children. When she arrived here, our mother had several lovers who followed her from the village where they had lived before. She was always strong in order to achieve her goals, and the main one was to procreate and to inculcate in us the same strength. 
My daughters and the daughters of my nieces are being brought up in the same way. Our trip along the northern coast of Mauritania is almost over. We have seen 400 kilometers of a wild and beautiful seacoast, of a stunning land, and of a people left to God's mercy. And to conclude, the ship's graveyard in Wadibu, a very special spot, a symbolic setting, a place that has been created as a sinister metaphor for the Mauritanian Sea. The city of Nwadibu, known in colonial times as Port Etienne, was developed during the 1980s to house the facilities that were supposed to promote the fishing industry. But pressures of all kinds, abuses and shady dealings have been the general tendency of this development. One of the consequences has been the abandonment of ships all along the coast, but especially in the Bay of Nwadibu. Sometimes the ships had suffered some damage or run aground. Other times they had accumulated unpaid fines. In any event, a surprising junkyard of nautical waste has been created over time. On the surface, there are more than 100 ships. Underwater, there are close to 1,000, they say. It's a tragic and beautiful setting, an aesthetic of rusty perversity, a place that reflects the contrast between the commercial fishing industry and the traditional fishermen. The predominance of steel over survival and solidarity.